So uh, welcome to this uh, to this talk. So it's uh, it's actually we've uh, we've created this talk and this slide deck for the first time. So it's uh, we'll have to bear with this. We we try to tune down the number of slides, but we'll have about 77 of them. So make sure to cover those. Um, so it, this is about embedding GDPR into the S. DLC. So it's a little bit too early for an acronym drinking game, um, but we'll, so we'll try to keep the acronyms as low as possible. Um, but this is really a story about um, two worlds and, and two sides of a story that we see uh, coming together more and more. Um, and actually, also the reason why we've been doing this talk is we, we actually work together at the same company. It's called Horion. We, we work in Belgium. And uh, see, we joined this last year. Uh, because of this increasing number of questions around privacy and GDPR projects. And what we see also a lot at our customers is that actually it's not one question, it's not only about GDPR and also the kind of projects that I am doing. So just, just to make sure, that we added pictures to make sure that you understand that I am Sebastian and he is Sibe. But um, what we see is that with software security projects, we see questions around GDPR. And with GDPR related projects, we also see that this is not something that stands on its own. So that's, that's really the reason that we wanted to like research more like how does this fit together? How can we like include this kind of compliance regulation, which is like quite, quite high level and then based on, on this regulation, fit together with something that's more like very practical that we try to embed in, in the software development life cycle. So that's, that's the background around this. Let's go. All right, so what are we going to talk to about today? I first will give you a very brief introduction into the GDPR, because some of you, or maybe most of you, might not know what it's all about. Afterwards, Seba will introduce you a bit into the SDLC and into the SAM framework, and then we will bring it all together, and we have created a mapping of SAM and the GDPR. And this mapping will show you how you can become GDPR compliant by introducing an SDLC and using SAM as a framework within your organization. And finally, we will uh, present some conclusions and next steps to improve the framework over the years and make it something that all of you can, can use within your organizations. <clears throat> so GDPR stands for General Data Protection Regulation and it's a new privacy legislation within Europe. The word, re the word regulation is important because it's not like a directive in which all nations can change the law within their own country, it means that the law is directly applicable in the entire European Union. The law will also remain applicable within the United Kingdom, even though Brexit will happen. Uh, the law will become applicable the 25th of May 2018, which means we still have like one year in order to become compliant. It might seem like a lot of time, but for most organizations, it will become nearly impossible to become fully compliant by the time. So it's really the time is now to start acting. What are the goals of the GDPR? The first goal is to, to unify privacy legislation within the entire European Union. And the second goal is to improve the rights of, of the protection of personal data and the rights of the data subjects. Um, the old privacy legislation uh, dates from 1995, which is more than 20 years old. And as we all know, 20 years ago, there didn't exist uh, big data, social media, the internet was still new. So in the, last pen, in the last 20 years, more data, personal data of all of us than ever before was collected and processed. So this new law tries to give control back to the data subjects, to us all. What is personal data? We often see that most people have a too narrow definition of personal data. Most people think personal data, it's my name, my address, and some other data which is very, very easy to think of. But all data which is, ident which is related to an identified or identifiable person is considered personal data, which means that a lot of IT data is also considered as personal data and must be processed as defined by the law. It means that, that cookies, uh, mailboxes, histories, surf history, uh, certain uh, card numbers, IP addresses, that they're all considered personal data and must be processed and protected well. If there's one thing you should know about the GDPR, because it's a very long and difficult legislation, it's this slide. The GDPR has seven principles, which just 
which should be followed in order to process personal data legally. If you do not abide with one of these seven principles, you're processing personal data on a legal matter and you should stop the processing. I'm not going to go too deep in these principles because I could talk one hour about these principles on this slide alone. But you should know that some of these principles are managed by a legal department, such as the justification and transparency uh, principle, but that other principles are directly related to application development and to security. For instance, the proportionality principle states that you can only use the personal data that you need uh, in relation to your finality, in relation to your goal. That means, for instance, if you design a new application, that you must make sure that you don't use data fields within your application that aren't necessary. It also means that you should define retention periods and that you should, should design automated tools in order to make sure that personal data is deleted when the retention period is, is passed. Uh, confidentiality. Uh, it means that data and applications which are built needs to be secure, that adequate security controls should be in place. And accountability. It means that you, as a controller or a processor, as an organization that processes personal data, must be able to prove by using audit trail, by using uh, artifacts, deliverables, that you have taken all the other principles in design. So if there is a, a law, uh, is, if there is a complaint, the, you should be able to prove that you did what, what was necessary. These are three articles that go deeper into confidentiality. So these are three articles that build further upon the principle of confidentiality. There are a lot of details within the articles, but in every article there is one principle that comes back. It says that you need to be able to identify security risks. So in your software development process, you need to start with identifying security risks and then build security controls in order to provide adequate technical and organizational measures in order to manage those uh, risks depending on your uh, risk appetite of your organization. All right, so which brings us indeed to the, to the software development life cycle. Um, so I'm very lucky or we're very lucky we have uh, guys like Siba around to go over all this legislation and, and to have us like understand specifically what is, what is necessary. Um, but before we, we add these like extra activities, we also have to understand what the security development life cycle is. So again, here I could also like explain for one hour what the software development life cycle is or a secure de software development life cycle is. But what it boils down to is you have, you have stages in software development like designing, building, testing and operating code. And, and then most of the time these are like sprints, iterations of, uh, of, of developers creating, creating software and functionality. Now, the whole idea of a well-functioning secure development life cycle is that you embed security activities like application security activities in those development activities, which means is we have to add threat molding, we have to add coding guidelines, source code reviews, security testing as part of the processes and the stages of producing software. And security testing is something that you do at the end. So security pen testing is not the only thing you should be doing, you should really go like introducing software security activities as early as possible in the different iterations. What's important there is that the, the people that are involved get some training, some awareness, and the, the way we introduce this is we use uh, like a, a secure development lifecycle framework. Uh, maybe you know, you know of uh, Microsoft SDL. Uh, what we use in our practice is OWASP SAM. So OWASP SAM is a um, software assurance maturity model, uh, which actually I'm one of the co-project leaders on, so it's not a coincidence that we're using this one. Uh, but it's actually one of the older uh, and, and more, uh, certainly a, a very mature project in the sense that it's being used a lot by organizations to introduce software security activities in development life cycles. Now this is built around 12 security practices, uh, which we have here at the bottom covering governance, governing building software, governing verification activities uh, in the secure development life cycle, and also covering operations uh, aspects in the, uh, in the secure development life cycle. So what we've done is we've, we've looked at this and we've really like, and, and that's where we work together, like how can we now 
like merge these two things together. Uh, and what we have in the GDPR and what's important there, it's, it has to be like risk risk based. You have to do these activities based on risk for your data subjects, based on risk that your software is being exposed to. Yes. So and that. Uh, and that's interesting because if you look in more detail in some, you will see that some, some activities are also risk-based. Specifically, if you, if you go into detail and, and go and look at some, there's like, under each of these 12 security practices, there's different levels of maturity with different, level of, with different security activities. You can't do everything for all software. So what you do is you pick the specific activities that are important for a software based on the risk or the risk level of your applications. And that matches very well with GDPR because that's also risk-based. So and that's why we did this, uh, this activity where, Sibi, maybe you can explain what you did. Uh, we looked at the same domains and we were looking what GDPR articles can we match with a different domain. Uh, we've created here a high-level overview, but we've also created a, a detailed overview for every maturity level of SEM. We have matched what the GDPR article relates to this. We will also make this detailed overview available to you all. It will be posted on the OWASP chapter uh, overview website. And now we will go into the details and let you see in more detail what can you do in order to become GDPR compliant by using SEM and by using the SDLC. First, we will talk about SM. It's about strategy and metrics and not sadomasochism within this presentation, to be clear. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> strategy and metrics, it means uh, that you need to create a risk management system within your organization. First of all, on enterprise level. Secondly, on application level. On enterprise level, it means that you should include GDPR and privacy and information security aspects in your overall risk profile of your organization. And that you should cre also create a GDPR implementation roadmap based upon these risks. If you have high risks related to certain privacy domains, you should create policy and control measures to control those risks, depending on your organization and the types of data processing that your organization does. Secondly, on an application level, you need to create a personal data inventory. The law states that you need to create an overview of all your processing records. This is a grand overview of all applications, all business processes in which you state which types of personal data are used within which process and in which application. And based upon this overview, you can define which applications are critical and have a high risk for the organization with, which in relation to the GDPR. Based upon these risks, you can then uh, do additional uh, assessments such as data protection impact assessments in order to further define the risk for an application and to mitigate those personal data risks. <coughs> Policy and compliance, I think this is a pretty straightforward domain. It it's states that the GDPR as a whole is an external compliance driver which should be taken into account when you design and when you create new applications and also for your organization as a whole. And that you should create the necessary policies and processes in order to make sure that these principles from the GDPR are taken into account when you build new applications. For instance, the GDPR says that you need to take pseudonymization into account. It's a system of how you make personal data less identifiable. So you can create a policy or an instruction nota in order to make sure that your developers follow the, uh, the basic principles of, your, of the GDPR within their operations. It's about creating accountability to the different roles, defining different roles within your organization and making sure that the people follow these roles. Uh, the data protection officer is also a very important person that should be appointed within your organization. And this person has a final accountability within the organization in relation to privacy. And this person is also responsible for monitoring the GDPR compliance within the organization. So this person has the rights to go to your operations team, to, to go to your door development teams and ask, do you follow these privacy policies? It's also better not to create privacy policies, but try to embed the privacy policies within operational policies of the teams. Because otherwise you get two or three sets of policies that might uh, 
conflict with each other, so it's best to collaborate with all the different teams in order to create one set of overview policies. Education and guidance. Um, the GDPR has a lot of new requirements and most people don't really know the GDPR. Uh, maybe do a little test. Who of you are uh, application developers? All right. Who of you know what the GDPR requires from you? Okay. Some people know here, but in most cases, then all hands go down. So it's also the task of the data protection officer to raise this awareness within the organization. And the data protection officer should therefore create a, an education matrix based upon the roles within the organization to make sure that all roles within the organization know what they need to do in relation to privacy and in relation to their roles. So for instance, developers, they should know everything about uh, confidentiality and security, which is required by the GDPR, but they should also know about the data subject rights. For instance, how can I implement data portability within a new application? Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> so, so what you see, here, so what you see is that we, for for each of the security practices, we we have the sum activities on on uh, on your left, and we have the GDPR activities or deliverables that we identify as being applicable in an, uh, in an application lifecycle or a development lifecycle on the right, so that we can match and try to like uh, have as much overlap and as much integration as possible. Now. What, what Sibe just has covered is the, the three security practices that are more like on the governance part of a development life cycle, where obviously there's a, a rather good fit with, with GDPR. Um, when it comes down to the, like the, the, the creation, the building of software, um, it's much more challenging. Uh, now, one of the first steps in a security development life cycle is doing a what we call threat assessment or a technical risk analysis. Uh, now, this is, this is crucial in, in itself as a very important activity to drive other security activities in the rest of the development life cycle. And it, uh, it looks and it combines very well with a like privacy risk analysis. So typically, in the beginning of a software development life cycle, you're going to look at what are my technical risks. And combined with that, you're also going to do, okay, what are my privacy, potential privacy problems there? And that we do with the data privacy impact assessment. Now, typically, you don't do this completely. You do that with like some kind of threshold questionnaire. And then if certain thresholds are, are passed, you do that in more detail and you would go for a full uh, data privacy impact assessment. So that's something that integrates quite well and we do more and more. Um, so one of the aspects, and you see that also there's different activities in threat assessment. One of the ones is also like making sure that you evaluate risk from third party components. Uh, come from components that are being used or supplied by, by your suppliers or that are being used by your processors or people that actually like run software functionality for you. So there that matches also with like the due diligence and the checks and that you have to do on the processors that process data for you. So that, uh, that's an important match there as well. So Sib is going to explain a little bit more what this data privacy impact assessment is? As we see with most customers, they really have a hard time defining what a data protection impact assessment is or what it, should, or what it needs to be. Uh, the law defines it. It's a methodology for identifying and mitigating compliance on conformities and personal data risks. So it means that a personal data impact assessment has always two different uh, types of, uh, of, of assessments that you do. It's based on the law and based on a personal data security. In order to conduct a good uh, data protection impact assessment, you really need three things. First of all, you need to describe the processing that you want to do and the application that you will build. So you will describe the processing and its purposes, the interests of your organization, and the list of third parties or also other internal parties that you will uh, share your data with, so you, you bring the data flows within, within, you map the data flows. Secondly, you need to identify the risks. Uh, the proportional, it starts with a proportionality assessment, which means that you should identify which data you use and try to define, do I really need all this data or can I build the same application with, with less data in, in, in order to still be able to reach my goals. 
uh, you should assess the data subject's rights. Can they uh, be rectified? Can the data be forgotten? All these things should be taken into account and be, should be taken into your backlog. You should uh, identify the information security risks. And if they are too high, you should take measures in order to mitigate them. And the, the final step is to describe the mitigation and then to define your residual risks. And if the residual risk is low, then you can go ahead and build the application. If the residual risk remains high, then you need to contact the, the Privacy Commission or your National Data Protection Authority in order to ask them if, if it's still okay or that you should take additional risk or if the project needs to be killed in some cases. All right, thank you. So, so this is a very important step, uh, which will drive the next one. Uh, and this is uh, an, an important security practice in, in some and for any uh, like in development is, uh, is requirements. Obviously, you need to have like create some functionality. Now, security requirements are more like the non-functionals, where in general, there are already like a whole set of security requirements you'd want to integrate here. And where we would piggyback on those based on also like the threat modeling activity and the, and the privacy impact assessment that we've done to add a couple of extra security requirements that are related to compliance. Specifically, these like opt-in versus opt-out, these like consent regulation, like how far do you want to go? It's not only primary use, but also secondary use. You need to capture that. And those you can actually add as security requirements to your, uh, to your project. Um, now, in general, um, what's, uh, what's important here is also to understand how your developers really like um, use these and, and, uh, and, and integrate these in their activities. So one of the ways that we see that works well is to create like what we call like GDPR epic overall, like what's the story, what, what's necessary for this application, but also like little stories, what, to be, what it has to be created or made or assured in the software itself. These are what we call then call the GDPR stories. And that, those are the kind of requirements that developers get uh, or developers get, and we add that to their product backlog. It's what like Shannon explained earlier on in the keynote. It's like you have to like wrap this in, in a way that developers can understand that and use this uh, within, their, in, within their development activities. So that's, that's a very important activity. Now there's different levels you see. It's like, and some is based on levels like in having like higher, higher maturity levels. Specifically, there's, there's requirements and we're not going to cover every like security requirement here that would bring us too far. But this is really the place where you can add the least privileged requirements, where you can add like retention requirements, where you can add like, is it necessary, yes or no, to encrypt or pseudonymize uh, or anonymize certain pieces of data. So that's um, all based on the threat modeling activity that we've done before. An important one is, and that's something to realize, is that rarely do we see software being created like one monolithic piece. It's really like pieces of software and services working together. Also having software suppliers or, or like uh, serve providing services. So having a data processing agreement in place with your suppliers is an important aspect of that as well. And maps really well on, on something you'd need to have as part of your GDPR uh, activities. Something to be checked here as well, which is important in GDPR, is also when you like use these services and like store data all around, is to have like these basic checks to make sure that this kind of data is not transferred out of Europe, because there you need like extra security uh, guarantees around that. So these map very well on specifically security requirements and the different levels of the security practice in the, in a some uh, development. So. Uh, one last uh, creation or construction security practice is security architecture, um, where I'll, I'll leave it for you uh, to go over all the security activities that are part of a typical uh, security ar architecture practice. What maps here really well from the GDPR is the privacy by design principles. Uh, in general, as an, as an architect, as a software architect, you want to have like uh, security patterns, security design principles uh, integrated in, in reference architectures, in reusable components in your software. And this privacy by design, if you integrate that in these specific uh, secure, uh, security principles, that, that combination is, can, can become very strong. Um, so here again, there is definitely things that we can map and we can integrate. So those are the, uh, the construction activities. 
where in the next, I would say, group of security practices in some, it's more focused on like making sure that what we should, that, that we were saying that we we're going to do, we did actually like deliver that. So an important part is there is design review. It's like checking indeed, does the software architecture, does the design cover our security requirements in the first place? So this is also a natural placeholder to make those checks versus the privacy requirements. A second one is, besides the design, is having a look at the code itself. So an important security practice called implementation review, which is actually doing source code review or static analysis as part of a security uh, activity, is making sure that the code actually doesn't have any security coding bugs in them. Now, here it becomes a little bit harder because is a coding bug like something related to like a GDPR? Um, is a coding bug related to um, not having like proper consent? So this is harder. Um, so this is one of the activities that maps re relatively bad on, on GDPR, but it, it does help to have some like basic checks uh, in place. And overall, being compliant with GDPR also means your software has to be secure. So the things that you're doing in terms of like software and, and, and testing and, and static analysis is good in, in overall in showing that you're taking appropriate technical measures. So in essence itself, it, it proves or it shows compliance, which is, the, which is also true for the next security practice, which is more focused on dynamic security testing. Where we had code analysis, you also have like dynamic testing of your software in a QA or a testing environment or even in production. What's important here is that you don't only go for testing the like the, is there input validation? Can I do SQL injection? Here also it's important that you take that first list of security requirements, including those privacy requirements, and also do like basic checking if indeed these were implemented in a correct way or not. Um, now there's a couple of uh, tools that also help you uh, checking if certain parts of, of the privacy is implemented correctly in, in, in a web applications. Uh, there's a tool like Ghostry, which helps you like to check what kind of cookies is an application using and what the reason, what's the reason behind, uh, behind those cookies. So those are basic checks which you can easily integrate in a security testing plan. Um, there's other tools like um, IAP, OneTrust, which does some automatic scanning on a web application to, to check for certain privacy-related uh, uh, aspects. So having a look at those tools, have a look at how you could integrate running those tools as part of your security test scanning uh, can help you there as well. So here you see that uh, for the, the testing parts, there's, there's a couple of placeholders where you can add or snap in these uh, GDPR activities. The GDPR also is a lot stricter um, when it comes to data breaches. As for now, there is no obligation whatsoever to, appoint, to report a data breach at whoever. The GDPR uh, commits that every organization who has a personal data breach should notify the National Data Protection Authority of this data breach. Uh, this should be done by the data protection officer, so this means that you should have within your organization an incident management process that involves the data protection officer. That the data protection officer is notified within your organization of the data breach. It also means that if you have to notify the data protection authority of data breaches, that you should be able to identify data breaches yourself as an organization. So you can do that by, with a manual process, a whistleblower process in which uh, employees can say, hey, I think you have a data breach, please uh, look at it. But it's even better to implement the necessary tools such as SIEM tools, uh, web, web application firewalls in order to identify data breaches whenever they, uh, they apply. Yep. Next slide. Okay. Yep. Uh, environment hardening. Um, it's also important that you have a, a, a patch system in place that for every new update there is to an application that you make sure that the necessary controls are again exercised in order to make sure that the update doesn't bring new security risks to your application or to your system. It's also important that when you have mo uh, more than one configuration possibility within your application that you make sure that after every update the most privacy-friendly setting is applied. That's called privacy by uh, default. 
that's the, the most privacy friendly setting by default is the one that's on. An example of uh, an organization that doesn't comply with this principle is Microsoft. Some people of you will use Microsoft 10. Deep within the settings of Microsoft 10 is a, is a checkbox which is automatically on, which states that Microsoft has access to all your data, including to personal data on Microsoft Office 365. You can put it out, but by definition, it's on. Uh, yeah, it's also important to have uh, systems trigger privacy or security related uh, incidents by uh, creating uh, logs. And this can be done by SIEM or web applications firewalls, as I said uh, before. Uh, finally, operational enablement. It means that you should have an uh, audit trail, that you should document everything you do in order to make sure that your organization is secure, that your applications are secure, and that you take the necessary steps when an incident occurs. So you should uh, document breach indicators to assure a timely follow-up. Uh, the most data protection authorities also provide uh, templates in order to follow up of incidents that should be used. So check the website of your local data protection authority in order to implement these documents within your data breach process. And uh, include GDPR considerations in all your operational security guides. If whatever you document related to your new application that you're building, make sure that you implement uh, GDPR within it, that you have a GDPR field in wi by which you can prove that you've taken GDPR into account during the entire process. All right, so that was in really like very fast, though, the, the 12 security practices of some and where we saw like overlap or parts we could integrate GDPR deliverables or activities. Um, now, we don't do this like for the fun of it. Um, what's, what we see is that there are a lot of projects that we actively really are uh, are like already doing this. So there's there's one customer, obviously we can't state which one it is. Uh, we, we have an NDA with these guys, uh, but they are, they are very open about this uh, and they also will allow us to share the outcome of the project here. Um, so, and this, uh, and this customer really not only wants to have like uh, a, a some assessment, they specifically also ask like, that's it's all good and fine, but I also want to have like an assessment in terms of GDPR compliance, and in this case also PCI compliance, because they're not only like working on privacy related <laughs> and sensitive information, they also like handled credit card information. So that's an excellent, uh, uh, an excellent use case where we do like sort of kind of like some assessment that's part of how you would apply and introduce a security development lifecycle framework in an organization in the first place. Um, but by integrating both like checks, what, how are you doing software uh, security and also how do you, do you take into account like GDPR activities and what do you do in terms of like PCI related activities, it becomes really like a combined approach instead of like separate activities which is definitely what we see already worthwhile because you only have to go to these development teams once with all the questions at the same time. Otherwise, they have to do this, like, go through this three times with different people. So that, that works really well. So um, we have agreement of this uh, particular customer that once we've done this, because it's real, really an ongoing work, so it maps really well on what we're doing here, is that once we have that questionnaire, we can share that also with, uh, uh, with the community. So we will definitely after, after that project, uh, share that questionnaire within the SAM project, together also with, uh, with the current mappings. So that's um, ongoing work there, but uh, quite interesting. Now, what we, uh, what we really like advocate here and what, uh, and what we see that it is adding the value really in, in terms of uh, the, the security development lifecycle is by adding also the, the GDPR activities as part of a security uh, activity, it, it reinforces that uh, and it integrates really on, really well on the development life cycle. So we have the development life cycle, we already like try to integrate security activities and by integrating the compliance activities, it all starts to work together. Um, What's important here, and, and, and that's also what, what, what's, what's important in terms of the software assurance maturity model, um, is you need to relate and understand how your developers produce and, and, and deploy software. So where the GDPR and also some of these security development lifecycle 
uh, activities are more like based on gates, uh, like before you put software in an acceptance environment, you have to do a code review. Before you do like a, a, like a release in production, you have to do like a pen test. That doesn't work anymore now. Iterations of like software releases are going that fast that you like need to automate and introduce security activities as part of a development life cycle. And likewise, also need to introduce the GDPR compliance requirements. So by, for instance, like we, we told by adding GDPR epics and stories to a product backlog, we make sure that indeed developers get fed with, uh, with the right sort of uh, requirements and, um, and activities. So what are the main advantages of what we've learned today? First of all, we should all remember that GDPR and SDLC reinforce each other. You can create a good security development lifecycle process by implementing the GDPR and SDLC make sure that personal data is adequately protected and by thereby make sure that you're GDPR uh, compliance. So you should really try to leverage both systems in order to make sure that your data is well protected. If you're a web application uh, security specialist, try to befriend the DPO. Try to create processes that are GDPR compliant and try to use the DPO as a friend in order to create more budget, in order to create more visibility, in order to create more support for security projects within your organization. It's a win-win. The DPO wins because he can make sure that the organization is compliant and you as a security specialist win because more security is implemented within the organization. So try to make use of this, of this moment in time when all organizations are GDPR focused, GDPR aware, and try to become GDPR compliant. Yeah, indeed. I think it's, uh, it, it's indeed, we get, right, and obviously you get a lot of questions around this. It's, uh, it's an excellent moment right now to use or abuse this like GDPR pressure to indeed support or create this business case for an overall secure development life cycle. So don't like focus too much on the GDPR side, have like something that works broad and you can like plug in the compliancy triggers and then next time there is another compliancy requirement that comes along, you can also start adding those in, the, in these activities. Something we've, uh, which, uh, which we've uh, covered a couple of times, but by providing the secure development life cycle deliverables, you actually start showing compliance towards whoever is going to ask for it. So if in the case you have an incident and a local DPA is going to like do an audit or do a preventive audit, uh, you can already demonstrate that you're actually doing this by showing the SDLC deliverables. And like indeed, like Sibis uh, said already, it's but extending the community of a secure development lifecycle, like you have security guys, you have development teams that try to work together, by adding also like people from the legal departments and from, from DPO and creating like this shared community, that, that's definitely something that will uh, be a key to, uh, to success here. Now, in terms of next steps, so we've, we've done this mapping. Uh, and we, for one, see, see quite some value in this and, 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 and are really implementing this in a, lot of, uh, well, in a couple of projects with our customers. What we're also going to do is share this with the, with the community. So there's a SAM project where we're going to donate uh, not only look like the high-level mappings, but also the detailed mappings and afterwards the questionnaire. Now, in one month, uh, maybe you're not aware of it, but if we are going to organize an OWASP summit. So it's not like a regular conference. It's like really a summit to work on, on a lot of deliverables. And there's definitely a couple of uh, some related uh, working sessions there. So we'll improve those and, and have some feedback from other project members as well. So and in general, like, like Shannon said, we really also like to get feedback. What do you think of this? Would you use this in your organization? If you use this and you see there's things that can be improved, please share that back with the community as well so that we can share this amongst each other. All right, which brings us to the questions. Any questions, remarks? There's, there's a mic here in, in, in front, or if you can share the mic there. So that afterward for the recording. Hello there, so I'm Simon from Vertical Structure. How are you doing? Um, thank you very much for the interesting talk. Um, I have a question about, uh, you, you know, mentioned briefly earlier on, uh, data shouldn't be transferred out of Europe. Um, do you have any thoughts about how this will apply after the UK leaves the EU and what, what we will do? I 
don't think it will have too much uh, implications for uh, Great Britain, but because Great Britain has stated that it will also implement the GDPR even when it leaves the European Union. So I think for personal data and privacy, it will be as Great Britain is still part of the European Union even after Brexit. All right. Other questions? Uh, uh, should we become nervous that we're now having legislation starting to direct our software development processes? Um, I can take this one. No, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, the, the legislation drives a lot of, of, other, of our activities in general, so I, I, I do say we should probably be very glad we have legislation to like have some kind of agreement between, between us and society. And, and in general, uh, security is, uh, is it's a little bit sad to say. If there is no like legal pressure, things will not improve. Um, so we should really use this as an opportunity. And instead of like fighting it, taking it as an opportunity to in, indeed make, make software safer sooner. Yes. All right. Hey, you mentioned that you wanted to integrate the GDPR to the uh, backlog by putting epic in stories. Do you actually also monitor that? Do you, do you use due dates for the stories or do you just put to, uh, 2018 May and that's it? <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, uh, that's a good question. It's, uh, it's not by adding it that it will actually be, be implemented. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's also making sure that there's awareness of the people who are involved that, that these stories are picked for, for some sprints before next, next May in, in 2018. So indeed, it's, uh, it's, it's by adding the stories you make it uh, like uh, understandable for development, but you also have to understand, uh, you have to make sure that by by talking to the stakeholders like marketing department, like business who really drives the, the implementation of the features that also need to include these, uh, these kind of like GDPR related stories. Yes, thanks for the talk. Uh, Tony Green from National Grid. Um, the GDPR rules uh, to me seem to be rules that apply to systems in production. Now, there is an activity uh, that, that goes before that, which is, for example, data migration, system migrations, and so on and so forth, where a different set of activities are taking place. So what's your view on data breaches during a development phase? The GDPR applies to all personal data. It doesn't matter if personal data is in a development phase or if it's in production. GDPR also requires you to protect your test environments. GDPR even advises, if it's possible, to use pseudonymized or anonymized data in test environments whenever possible. So a data breach within a test environment is as bad as a data breach within a production environment. All right. So um, if you have any other questions, uh, please, uh, please come and join us uh, directly afterwards. Uh, if they, those questions pop up later on, uh, don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, I have an OWASP email address if you have questions about SAM, if you have questions about uh, the privacy or security related activities, both TIB and my email address are available. Um, I do answer to emails, it just can take some time. All right. Okay, enjoy the conference. <laughs>